Tonight, we're going to learn a number of different things. First, I'm going to give you a insight into the story of the golden calf, which uh, I think is absolutely remarkable. And uh, I hadn't really heard it anywhere else, so I say it with a certain trepidation, as one does when one discovers something in the Torah. <clears throat> there is a question that has always troubled me about uh, this Parsha. And by the way, it doesn't trouble just me. It seems that it troubles Korach later as well. Mm. And the question is this. Moshe has an older brother, Aaron, who is complicit in the building of a golden calf, an idol. And yet, it seems almost as a result of it, he becomes the kind Gadol, mm -hmm. high priest. <clears throat> the Mepharshim give two major reasons for his involvement. One of them is that it was his goal to delay the, uh, the building of, of the golden calf and the idol and everything, and if he was involved, he could delay the process long enough that Moshe would come down from the mountain. Because he came down on the 40th day, but it was not at the beginning of the 40th day, and there was a question about he should have been down already at the beginning of the 40th day, and that's why they did it. Mm -hmm. Although I should say the Gomorrah has three different times in which it seems that the people began to talk about a replacement for Moshe. Mm -hmm. We should note here they're not talking about a replacement for God. It's a very important thing to understand. Mm -hmm. uh, Rav Hirsch will talk about this in more detail later. Um, but they're looking for a replacement for Moshe Rabbeinu, not for God. Mm -hmm. It seems that uh, either he was trying to delay, Aaron was trying to delay until Moshe came down, or well, the second explanation is given <clears throat> was that Hur, um, Miriam's uh, brother, brother or nephew? No, it's an, it's not a brother. I think she's married to Caleb. Right? That's their, isn't it? His the son, their son, I think. Yeah, I think so. Uh, they kill him. He's killed. He's sure. Moses for put them both in power for right? resisting Aaron, for her. resisting the golden calf. Yeah. And Aaron understood that if he resisted, He's going to get that he would be killed, mm -hmm. and dreaded that the results of the killing of Moshe's brother would have such a uh, injurious impact on the people mm -hmm. that they would never recover from it in God's eyes. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> so <clears throat> it wasn't personal fear of death. It was more that the, the punishment would be so great on the people that he didn't want that. Mm -hmm. So these are the two explanations that I've seen over the years mm -hmm. for why Aaron participated in the making of the golden calf. They call it a classic example of mob, mob mentality. Yeah, that's, that's right. Essentially all that's the right. mob, right? Individual people wouldn't do it, but the whole mob, oh, let's kill them. And, <laughs> and, and, and as we read through this, we will see that it, there is a mob element, a very strong mob element mm -hmm. to it. Charles is right. Uh, <clears throat> I never found these satisfying explanations. Mm -hmm. Maybe it would prevent the death of Aaron, but it would cause the promotion of Aaron sounds strange, mm -hmm. strange right? Mm -hmm. <clears throat> I mean, we know that you give your life for three reasons, right? Does anyone know what the three reasons are? Anybody remember the three reasons? Idol worship. Idol worship is one. Mm -hmm. right? if, if you're not supposed to break the Sabbath. But that well, that's part of idol worship, idol worship in a way, right? Yeah. Yeah. So the second is, if you're told to murder somebody else, yeah, you're, you should die before die you do it, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. Sexual immorality? Correct. Mm -hmm. if, if you're being forced into a situation of sexual immorality, mm -hmm. you should give your life before you mm -hmm. give in to it. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> so building a golden calf certainly qualifies as not only idol worship, mm -hmm. but facilitating idol worship, mm -hmm. making it more possible for others to worship idols. Mm -hmm. How much more serious called the homer. So they should do what her uh, did. This. What? They should do what her did, refuse. It would seem that way. Yeah. It would seem that way. So th the question stands, why was he rewarded for... It seems like he's rewarded for this. Mm -hmm. What's the reason? Mm -hmm. 
<clears throat> Let's look at the story. Mm -hmm. uh, first of all, uh, we have to realize that the people in the at the foot of Mount Sinai <clears throat> were not simply the children who were descendants of the house of Yaakov, Avraham, Yitzhak, and Yaakov, right? Mm -hmm. A very large percentage, clearly a majority, maybe as much as 80%, mm -hmm. were made up of other people from Egypt, mm -hmm. right? Native Egyptians, other people escaping, whatever. Not uh, people of the family of Avraham. Mm -hmm. At the time that they left, God suggested that the heir of Rav, this is called the mixed multitude, not come along. And Moshe Rabbeinu said, they'll be fine. I am their guarantor. Mm -hmm. So I would ask a question. Moshe Rabbeinu and his brother Aaron had very, very different upbringings. Mm -hmm. right? On one side... You have Moshe growing up in the palace in all the refinement of ancient Egypt. You know, the finest foods, the finest genteel manners, right? uh, great intellect and studying, uh, a lot of learning, not always of the right things, mm -hmm. but dark arts as well. Um, but all of the refinements of the ancient world, he grew up in this palace. Right? His older brother, was the leader, the son, like Moshe Reino, of Amran, Yochavid, <coughs> the leader of the tribe of Levi. Mm -hmm. And as the leader of the tribe of Levi, the spiritual leader of a band of slaves. Uh, he didn't actually participate in the slavery, though, right? Because Levites were excluded, right? He, that's right. Mm -hmm. Levi were, were not slaves in mm -hmm. Egypt. They were what's called freemen. Mm -hmm. They couldn't leave Egypt, mm -hmm. but be, for a number of different reasons, because of the priesthood, because they were uh, aggressive about not serving Paro. There's a number of different reasons given why they didn't become slaves, but they were far from free people. Mm -hmm. But he was the spiritual leader of this group. And he, daily he witnessed the most abominable behavior on the part of the taskmasters, on the part of the Egyptians. Mm -hmm. You know, if you are a slave to an individual, it's a lot better off than being a slave to a nation. Mm -hmm. Because you can find favor in your master's eyes. You can become very valuable to your master. You know, you can be a math teacher to his children. You can have some special skill that is of value to him. You can be very powerful and help him with chores that need to be done. Mm -hmm. But if you're a slave to a nation, nobody cares about you at all. Mm -hmm. You're just another number, mm -hmm. right, that goes out to work every day. And if you don't, you die. Mm -hmm. You don't own your family. You're not a husband. You're not a father. You're not a brother. You're not a sister. You're not a mother. Nothing. Mm -hmm. right? Nothing. You are a slave. That's it, right? You are a machine, a working machine, and you work until you die. Mm -hmm. That's how it is. And that's how it was in Egypt. You know, the, the family structure was tested and tested and tested in Egypt. And it was very difficult. Um, and what Aaron saw was the worst kinds of physical and psychological torment that one could imagine. It says that the cities of Pithom and Ramses were built on, um, uh, on quicksand mm -hmm. just to break the spirit oh of, the, of the Jews, right? That, you know, Stalin, mm -hmm. uh, in an effort to torture mm -hmm. those who objected to his position, mm -hmm. would have people on Monday move everything from the north side of the warehouse to the south side. Whoa. And on Tuesday, move it back to the north side. <laughs> yeah, just for the hell of it, just yeah. to make them move crazy. Because yeah. useless work is tremendously demeaning. You know, there's a, a very famous and wonderful movie called Bridge on the River Kwai. I don't know if anybody's seen it. Oh, yeah. 
It's worth seeing at some time. It's a very it's an interesting Jones. movie. Uh, and uh, in it, British prisoners of war mm -hmm. are conscripted into building a bridge across the River Kwai mm -hmm. for the Japanese. Mm -hmm. right? And they determine to put their pride into the work they do. Mm -hmm. right? They're very determined. If they're going to do something, they will do it well. It's a very kind of British stiff upper lip kind mm -hmm. of thing. You know? <laughs> and uh, not to curry favor with the Japanese, but to just to show them how good they were, mm -hmm. even under these conditions. And of course, the bridge is a tactical advantage for the Japanese war machine. Mm -hmm. So a decision is made in Whitehall in England that the bridge has to be destroyed. And so they send, the British send a team. Uh, what's his name? Is Sir Alec Guinness, isn't it? Alec Guinness plays he's, the British. He's, he's he the plays one the British in the camp. In the camp. Yeah. And, but who's the name of the American who's in it? He's very famous. He, it's Burt Lancaster, isn't no, it? No, not Burt Lancaster. Uh, mm -hmm. Maverick. Oh, oh, James Garner. James Garner, James yeah. Garner is yeah. in it, right? Yeah. Uh, and they come as a special ops team mm -hmm. to destroy the bridge. Mm -hmm. Well, the stress that goes on for the, for the builders of the bridge is very, very painful because they've put so much into it, they don't want the bridge destroyed. <laughs> At the same time, you know, they, they should want the enemy to be hurt. Yes. I won't tell you the end. Okay. <laughs> a great movie. But useless work is something that destroys people's minds, mm -hmm. not just their bodies. And this was something that Aaron witnessed daily mm -hmm. with, the, uh, with the Jews. So I'm, I'm explaining something about the um, social history going into uh, the, the story of the Golden Calf. So Aaron's experience about the, the Mitzri was very different than Moshe's one. Mm -hmm. yeah. You know, the, the Paro saw Moshe as a kind of son. You know, mm -hmm. He was in a very good place. You know? He had schlep, as they say. Mm -hmm. uh, but in the background, there was always a danger, because we know he did a little mistake and he had to leave town. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <clears throat> but Moshe has no fear of the palace, by the way, mm -hmm. because of this experience. When it's time to leave and God says to Moshe, don't take the Arab route. And he says, I will guarantee, I'm their guarantor. They'll be okay. Mm -hmm. you know, the mixed multitude. I would ask you, in this argument between God and Moshe Benu, where do you think Aaron would stand? Hmm. They should bring them or they shouldn't bring them? Where do, where do you think with his background and experience with these people? Where Aaron was then? Yeah. No, it's obvious Aaron would go with God. Say, don't, don't take these people. Yeah, that's right. I would, I would, He's that would be my side. supposition. We don't yeah. know for sure, yeah. but I would say that he You'd would say, yeah. You're crazy. Uh, I know these people, <laughs> yeah, yeah. and they are very dangerous. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, the, the only reason they're coming with you is not because they're loyal to God, yeah. but because they understand that our God is stronger than they're, they're, their God, mm -hmm. and they're switching sides. Yeah. That's all it is. It's not a devotion. Mm -hmm. There were some exceptions. Mm -hmm. For instance, the mother of Moshe Rabbeinu, Basia, Batya, mm -hmm. she was clearly a tzaddikus, right? mm -hmm. and she was an exception. This is a first convert. Yeah, uh, but she was, well, Sarah really was. Yeah, Sarah, yeah. Yeah. Uh, but the, uh, but it says she went down to the Nile to convert, mm -hmm. actually, to be in a mikvah. That's yeah. what she did yeah. that when she found Moshe Rabbeinu, so you're right. Uh, <clears throat> the, uh, so there's Aaron saying to Moshe Rabbeinu, it's a dangerous idea. Mm -hmm. Take the descendants of, of Avram, Yitzhak, and Yaakov. Mm -hmm. They're the ones who were enslaved. Take them. Everybody else, you know, listen to what God said. Mm -hmm. Don't do it. But this is what Moshe says. And we see that there's a constant complaining that goes on. So what happens now, all right? God summons Moshe to go to the top of the mountain. Mm -hmm. He's declared the Ten Commandments already, right? And he, he said, go up to the top. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> so in verse 32, it says, he's supposed to be down in 40 days, right? And this discussion that we see here 
Some say it happened after only about a week and a half. Some say it happened after about three weeks. The majority hold that it happened on the 39th day. Mm -hmm. People saw that Moshe had delayed in descending the mountain. <clears throat> And the people gathered around Aaron and said to him, Rise up and make for us gods that will go before us. For this man, Moshe, who brought us up from the land of Egypt, we do not know what became of him. He's late. The mountain is smoking. It's a dangerous place up there. Mm -hmm. You know, there's a good chance he's not coming back. It's in 493 right. and 495. Right. Okay, thank you. <clears throat> Uh, Aaron said to him, Remove the rings of gold that are in your ears and your, your wives and sons and daughters and bring them to me. Right. The entire people removed their gold rings that were in their ears and brought them to Aaron. Now, the Medrash tells us clearly it wasn't the entire people's reference mm -hmm. to the men. Okay. The women refused to do this. Mm -hmm. right. So one of the um, Farsham says that's why it's not a golden bull. Mm -hmm. It's a golden calf. They were short on gold because the women didn't give up their gold. So it's the Charleston Heston movie is wrong. I don't look the movie does. No, there's different midrashim. The actual Charleston Heston movie is actually, in many ways, very close. Serious? Yeah, it's very close. It's fun to watch, but it's not based on Hawk, It's based on midrashim that they choose. That's what I was thinking. But it's a lot of things that happen in the don't. That's not. I wouldn't use it as yeah. a source. Mm -hmm. right. yeah. It's fun to watch. I like it in my some <laughs> yeah. But it's better than many biblical yeah. dramas. Right? Yeah. But there, there, we remember we were watching, there's such an right. in Christian element to it. It's, yeah, there's yeah. an element of it. Yeah. Now, just as a bit of trivia, I can't help myself here. Mm -hmm. Who plays the voice of God in, in the Ten Commandments? I know the answer that. You can't answer it. But. Yeah. Hmm. Anybody know? Charles? Okay. Right. It's Charlton Heston. No. Cecil, yeah, it is. It's Charles Cecil, Cecil, Cecil B. DeMille. Even Mills. No, no. In, in, the, in the, when he's talking to the golden cow, it go to the burning bush, it's Charlton Heston. No. Charlton Heston is Moshe. Yes, I know, but he also plays God. Because I, I thought it was also Cecil B. DeMille, but I it, I used to type that too. But if the IMDB, I believe, says that it was him. They just slowed his voice down a little bit. That they, 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 he's talking to himself. The bio that I saw, it would yeah. be interesting if it yeah. was, actually. Yeah, yeah. But I'll, I'll check again okay. tonight on IMDb, okay. but the last time I checked, okay. I remember it was... Okay. It was Rumor him. has it, yeah, it was Cecil, Cecil B. DeMille, Cecil the executive producer, yeah, yeah. Yeah. who yeah. usually yeah. likes to play God in any movie. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. But it may be Charlton Heston. Yeah. I don't know. Yeah. That's what Charles said, so yeah. we'll find out. It's possible with Cecil B. DeMille, but I I remember this in the raining that they... There's two opinions on this, right? One opinion is Cecil B. DeMille. Yeah, yeah. Because IMDb, I think, says that. I have to check. I have to check. You have to make sure. Okay. Uh, so, uh, okay, so that's why it's, some say that's why it was a golden calf and not a golden bull. And we can talk about this more in detail, but the Zohar describes a ceremony in which a uh, golden calf, a golden bull, once a year would fly across the Nile River on the birthday of the Paro. Very interesting now we're talking piece. about something back in Egypt. Back in yeah, Egypt, yeah. right? And uh, this was the event that Yosef was alone with Potiphar for, mm -hmm. because everybody went to see this event mm -hmm. each year, right, at the Nile, mm -hmm. except Yosef wasn't interested in Potiphar, he was more interested in Yosef than, mm -hmm. than the event. So it says this was the day that this happened. Is that when so, his wife, right? So the idea, of a, the idea of a bull that could... Uh, be animated, a golden bull that could be animated, was something that predated mm -hmm. this event. It was something that was a, a yearly event in mm -hmm. Egypt. Was that from Crete? Crete had a minotaur. Crete had a minotaur, but this is actually a golden bull itself, mm -hmm. not not a half bull. The minotaur is half, right? Uh, yeah. But does that something There's to do a reference to Joseph? Because he's known as the bull, or, right? There's, well, it's very it's interesting kind of because he's called it. Shore, sure, right? Yeah. Uh, because we know that, uh, and it plays a role in this as well, now that you mention it, is that there was a golden amulet that was used to raise the uh, casket of Yosef from the Nile. He was buried in the Nile. Mm -hmm. It was a segula for the Nile. Uh, a, a, um, uh, a sign for the Nile that it should flood, mm -hmm. that Yosef would be there, it would be mm -hmm. good for the Egyptian people. 
when it came time to leave, the question is how to make a plea, how to and, find it. And the right? Torah says that they took his bones out. And yeah, so yeah. how did There's they get a it? Mm-hmm. So Sarah, who was the a daughter of um, which tribe? It'll come to me in a second. Just be patient with me. Mm-hmm. Uh, who was the? Uh, she was the one who told uh, Yaakov that Yosef was alive. Mm-hmm. Medrash tells us that the brothers were. She was Asher's daughter, Asher's daughter, and the brothers were afraid to tell their father that Yosef mm-hmm. was alive when they came back, for fear that the shock would kill him. Mm-hmm. So his granddaughter Sarah sang him a song. I won't sing the song, but it was goes, uh, you know, your son Yosef is alive and he's viceroy in Egypt. <laughs> right? Mm-hmm. Beautiful song she sang for him. Right? And just put, just put it into the air in the most beautiful tones and he came to understand that this was true. Mm-hmm. Right? And then there were questions about it and he verified. But the initial shock he got through because of the way she did it, mm-hmm. he blessed her with long life. Mm. This is even so, incredibly long, right? Incredibly long. She yeah. lived at, to, to the time of David. Yeah. Russia. yeah. But when it came time understand. to find out where is Yosef, who is still alive, Sarah. Mm. And she said, he's there. Right. And what they did was they took a golden amulet that said, Ale Shore, mm-hmm. rise bull, rise ox, right? And threw it in the, the water, and the casket just lifted out of the water. Mm-hmm. And it was like, a feather for Moshe to carry by himself. Mm-hmm. See how heavy that must have been, right. Right? and yet it came out. Now and that's how he got it. It says on the Torah that he has the bones. A, so a young person from the era of Rav saw this mm-hmm. and retrieved the amulet mm-hmm. and put it into the gold that Aaron had com- com- well, he holds put all together it's needed, right? into a bag, right? and threw it in the bag. Right? And when Aaron threw the bag into the fire. It had the amulet that said, Ale Shor, mm. arise ox. Mm. And from the fire arose a moving, physically moving animal. Well, it's, it's, the story says it jumped right. out. It even says right. it <clears throat> jumped out. So it says here, mm. he took from their hands and bound it up in a cloth, the gold, right, and fashioned it into a molten ca- calf. They said, this is your God, O Israel, who brought you up from the land of Egypt. Now, it's an interesting phrase, because Jews, children of Israel, mm-hmm. Yaakov, right, mm-hmm. would not use that phrase. Mm-hmm. They would say, this is our God who brought us up out of the land of Egypt. Somebody's talking to them, mm-hmm. right? It's the heir of wrath. Aaron saw, and he built an altar before him, meaning, uh, I think, the calf, Aaron called out and said, a festival to Hashem tomorrow. He's trying to divert it, mm-hmm. right? Whatever it is, we'll do it for God tomorrow, right? Mm-hmm. So number one, we'll delay it. And number two, it's not about the calf, it's about Hashem, mm-hmm. right? That's what he's saying. <clears throat> they arose early the next day, <clears throat> <clears throat> and they offered elevation offerings and brought peace offerings. <clears throat> And the people sat to eat and drink, and they got up to revel. Scene change. Top of the mountain. Hashem spoke to Moshe. Go and descend for your people that you brought up from the land of Egypt to become corrupt. Now, I know that Michael never misbehaves. (laughs) I'm sure of that, right? (laughs) So you are always referring to Michael as my son. Mm-hmm. But if it was that just one moment, mm-hmm. he might, hard to believe, <laughs> misbehave. You might say to your wife, your son didn't make his bed today. Mm-hmm. <laughs> right? yes. Could happen. Yeah. Right? So this is what God said, right? Right. Well, said, saying, this is not my people, it's your people. It's not the people I took out of Egypt. Mm-hmm. Go descend for your people that you brought up from the land of Egypt to become corrupt. Right. 
They have strayed quickly from the way I have commanded them. They have made themselves a molten calf and prostrated themselves to it and sacrificed to it. And they said, This is your God, O Israel, who brought you up from the land of Egypt. Hashem said to Moshe, I have seen this people, and behold, it is a stiff-necked people, and now desist from me, leave me, let my anger flare up against them, and I shall annihilate them, and I shall make you a great nation. Mm-hmm. Right? So the, he's saying to Moshe Rabbeinu, they're finished. Everybody in the camp is finished. Right? <laughs> they just bought it. I'm going to start with you. <laughs> right? The, you know, your plan B. Right? Moshe pleaded before God. Right? This is a characteristic of great leaders. Right? Remember, Abraham did the same mm-hmm. right? in Sodom. For Sodom. There's lots of that's just arguing with God. He argues with God lots of times. Yeah. <laughs> Why, Hashem, should your anger flare up against your people whom you have taken out of the land of Egypt with great power and a strong hand? So there is a question now here, right? Because he's saying they're your people, mm-hmm. right? But God is saying, no, the, the people you took out, right? <laughs> it seems like Moshe is trying to combine them back together mm-hmm. in this sentence, right? Mm-hmm. Where Hashem has clearly made a separation, mm-hmm. right? Why should Egypt say the following? With evil intent did you take them out to kill them in the mountains and to annihilate them from the face of the earth? Relent from your flaring anger. Reconsider regarding the evil against your people. Remember for the sake of Avraham, Yitzhak, and Israel, not Yaakov, Israel, your servants, to whom you swore by yourself, and you told them, I shall increase your offspring like the stars of heaven, and this entire land which I spoke, I shall give your offspring, and it shall be a heritage forever. So he's making a series of arguments. One, you made an oath, right? You're the God who keeps his word. You took them out of Egypt by saying, I remember my promises. Two, it looks very bad. You took them out of Egypt to kill them? Mm-hmm. Paro could have done that in Egypt, mm-hmm. right? And you were too weak? The world will say you were too weak to be their leader, mm-hmm. right? It doesn't look good. Reconsider. Hashem reconsidered regarding the evil that he had declared he would to his people. Moshe turned and descended from the mountain. Now, Moshe right now has been the great defender of Israel and has saved Israel, right? Mm-hmm. So you think he'd be feeling okay. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Moshe turned and descended from the mountain with the two tablets of testimony in his hand, tablets described on both sides. They were inscribed on one side and on the other. The tablets were God's handiwork. The script was the script of God engraved on the tablets. God actually did the engraving on, on the first set. Yeah. Joshua heard this. And now Joshua was partway up the mountain waiting for... His boss. Yeah, he was right? about to sit down. Joshua is number two in this process, mm-hmm. right? He is the aide de camp, so to speak. The, he the, must the, have the, brought like six yeah. significant provisions for him because he's there for 40 days. So he must have. Mm-hmm. I don't know. Out. Maybe he didn't need the other. I'm not sure. Yeah. I'm not sure. Because they say that Moses <clears throat> is fed by God or maintained by God, right? But but just just, just Joshua. It's an interesting he question. Must, must have brought sufficient provisions mm-hmm. for himself. Joshua heard the sound of the people in its shouting, and he said to Moshe, the sound of battle is in the camp. Mm-hmm. Joshua was a soldier, remember this? Mm-hmm. Right? Sounds of battle is in the camp. Mm. He said, meaning Moshe said, not a sound of shouting strength or a sound shouting weakness. A sound of distress do I hear. It happened as he drew near the camp and saw the calf and the dances mm-hmm. that Moshe's anger flared up. Mm-hmm. Right? Now Moshe is the one who's angry, not God. Right? Now it's Moshe. He threw down the tablets from his hands and shattered them at the foot of the mountain. He says there's an idea that under the wedding canopy, if you were to to take another partner, how awful it would be to do it after you've signed your ketubah. And the tablets were the ketubah of the people, right? Mm. So better they should be destroyed than they be the bris that binds them to God mm. and they've already you know had this misconduct underneath mm. the, the wedding oh, canopy wow. with God yeah wow it happens he drew near the camp and saw the calf and the dancers Moshe's anger flared up he threw down the tablets from his hands and shattered them at the foot of the mountain he took the calf that they had made and he burned it in fire 
He ground it into a fine powder and sprinkled it over the water, and he made the children of Israel drink. This is clearly a reminder of the sota coming later, mm. uh, which we'll just keep it in mind for the future. Mm -hmm. okay. Now Moshe turns to his brother at this point, and he says, Moshe said to Aaron, what did this people do to you that you brought a grievous sin upon it? I left you in charge. Mm -hmm. What did they do to you that you would allow this to happen? Mm -hmm. How could you allow this to happen? Mm -hmm. Did they anger you so much that you allowed them to do this? Aaron said, let not my, my master's anger flare up, for you know the people is disposed towards evil. They said to me, make us a God that will go before us for this man Moshe who brought us up from the land of Egypt. We do not know what became of him. So I said to him, who has gold? To them, who has gold? They removed it and gave it to me. I threw it in the fire and the calf emerged. emerged. See, it mm -hmm. jumped out. Right. It didn't form it. <laughs> now here is the key sentence. Okay, Let me read the sentence to you. Vayare Moshe, Esa'am ki perua hu, ki perua achara, acharon, acharon, shimtsa, excuse me, dika meam. Rav Hirsch's translation is, and Moshe saw the people that it was unrestrained that Aaron had left it in its moral weakness without restraints, to the degree of utter irresolution in the midst of those who rose up against the law. Let's see what this one says. Hmm. Moshe saw the people that it was exposed, for Aaron had exposed them to disgrace among those who rise up against them. Same sentence. Hmm? Mm -hmm. Does it strike anybody that the sentence doesn't make any sense at all? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Like, it's kind of a very strange phrase. Mm -hmm. And in here is a very important word, right? If you look at your Chomesh, right, you'll see a word. It's used twice. In the bottom line, Ha'am ki perua, hu ki perua. See those two words? Now, look at those words without vowels and tell me if they might be another word. You're talking the first three letters, ki perua. So, hayon is H, che, yad, im is a sema, the mem suffix. Just look at the third word itself, right? Look at the third word itself and imagine you could put any vowels in there you wanted to. What? Faro. Paro. You're right. Mm -hmm. right. So because we have vowels, we read this ki perua hu ki perua. Mm -hmm. right. Say faro. But if you look in the Sefer uh, Shemois, mm -hmm. in Sefer Torah, it doesn't say that. Mm -hmm. right? We have a tradition that this is peru. Right? But maybe it means Paro, paroized, so to speak. So let me try reading it to you again. Moshe saw the people that it was pharaohized. <laughs> for Aaron had exposed their pharaohization to disgrace among those who rise up against them. And now look at Moshe's reaction. Mm -hmm. right? That's a different opinion. Right? Remember, moments ago, Moshe was very angry with Aaron. Mm -hmm and defensive about the people. What did they do to you that you would behave in such a way? Mm -hmm. Aaron has this one statement, you know, about Perua, right? and suddenly Moshe stood at the gateway of the camp and said, whoever is for Hashem, join me. And all the Levites gathered around him, and he said to them, so said Hashem, the God of Israel, every man put on his sword on his thigh and passed back and forth from the gate to gate in the camp let every man kill his brother, every man his fellow, every man his near one. Yeah. Mm -hmm. 
and the Levites did so. Right? So something changed mm -hmm. at the moment this term is used. Mm -hmm. Now here's what I would suggest. Pharaohized. What does that mean? Fifth column. Fifth column. Let's go back to the camp again, right? And let's look at these two men, Aaron and Moshe mm -hmm. right? In Aaron, you have a man of the people. In Moshe Rabbeinu, you have a man of God. Mm -hmm. It seems clear that Moshe's responsibility is to bring the law to the people, to bring Hashem to the people. And Aaron's job is to bring the people up to God. Mm -hmm. Right to meet halfway, so to speak. And we know that Aaron was somebody. He's described. How is he described? Does anybody remember what his quality is? He's, he's a, man a peacemaker, peace. man of peace who pursued peace. Mm -hmm. Right. And the example. It's one of the examples that is often given about the fact that truth sometimes can be su submissive to peacemaking. Mm -hmm. That it's a, a famous medrash that. Aaron would come to Reuben and Shimon, and they were fighting with each other and pleasant to each other. And he would go to Shimon and say, you know, I bumped into Reuben today. <laughs> and I have to tell you, he feels very bad about how things are going between the two of you. Mm -hmm. You used to be friends, work together. He still cares about you a great deal. Mm -hmm. Could you see it? I'd like to sit with him and maybe I'll sit with you as well and we can work things out. Mm -hmm. Now he made all of it up. He hadn't seen. It. <laughs> and so Shimon says, "Yes." So now he goes back to Reuben and says, mm -hmm. "You know, I was just talking to, to Shimon and mm -hmm. tell you, he feels mm -hmm. that this is not the way it should be between the two of you, and he's willing. He's offered to be the one to come and sit with you, mm -hmm. and we can work all this out. And I'll be with you too." Right? Mm -hmm. And through this process, he would make peace between. Mm -hmm business partner, business partner, between mm. brother and brother, between even husband and wife. Right? Mm. He was a peacemaker. He would go through the camp settling arguments between people. Mm. Moshe Rabbeinu was the lawgiver. Mm. Right? And he was not in a way empowered to even be lenient. Mm -hmm. Even if he wanted to be. He was a direct channel for the word of God. Mm -hmm. So he couldn't interpret. He just had to stay. And we see, when he's not clear, he doesn't think of an answer. He goes, excuse me, and he goes and asks God, come back. Mm -hmm. He always has an open channel to God, unlike other prophets. Mm -hmm. He's always on call, and God seems to always be on call for him as well. Mm -hmm. So Aaron, it seems like, is much more a man of the people. Mm -hmm. And we know that when Aaron and Moshe died, that the people mourned much more intensely and for a longer time for Aaron than they did for Moshe mm -hmm. So let's look at this one more time with all this in mind. They're leaving Egypt. Right? Moshe has this tremendous faith in everybody. Mm -hmm. Anybody who wants to join the team is welcome to, whether mm -hmm. they're children of Yaakov or not. Aaron is very skeptical. Mm -hmm. Don't do it. God said don't do it. I'm telling you, don't do it. Mm -hmm. right? They find themselves over and over and over challenged. There were no graves in Egypt, you had to bring us here mm -hmm. to die, right? There's no food, we want meat, you know. It's always complaining, complaining, complaining. Yeah? And it's coming from one source, mm -hmm. also. Right? So, Haran is aware that within the camp there is a cancer growing. Mm -hmm. And the people keep saying they want to return to Egypt. Mm -hmm. And Paro is waiting for them to come home. <laughs> you know? He's got plans for them when they come back. No <laughs> question about it. There are necromancers, there are magicians, mm -hmm. there are courtiers of Paro that are among this group of people. Mm -hmm. Bilaam's son is in this crowd. <laughs> Aaron knows it and feels that they are not on side, that really they're there to poison and to destroy the venture. Mm -hmm. But how does he tell his brother? How does he convince his brother, who is an idealistic person, mm -hmm. and feels it's going to go well? I would venture to say 
that Aaron made a decision because he really is the perfect internal security officer that could be. Mm -hmm. He knows what goes on in every tent. He knows every problem, every argument, every solution. He is the ear of the nation. Mm -hmm. I would venture to say that Aaron knew better than anybody how dangerous the Arab Rav was and what a potential problem it would be. And he made a concrete decision to sacrifice his own life in this world and in the world to come. Much greater sacrifice. By the way, we've just come out of Purim, mm -hmm. where we saw a similar sacrifice by Esther, mm -hmm. where she sacrificed her position in the world to come in order to save the Jewish people. No benefit to herself. Mm -hmm. And so I would say it is here too that Aaron really does play the agent provocateur. He allows this to happen because if Moshe Rabbeinu doesn't see it now, mm -hmm. everything, the whole venture could go down the tubes. And he knows it. Mm -hmm. And so he's willing to give up everything to build an idol that his brother will see what he and God both knew. Just the proof that there's a very big percentage of, of the camp mm -hmm. that is paroized, parua, mm -hmm. pharaoh. Who uses the term paro, pharaohized? It's right here. It's the is word it paro is here. What? Does Moshe use the term? It says that he observes it. He Be observes it. He observes it based on what he's been told by Aaron. Right. The, the term it goes like this. Right. That the camp was pharaohized. No, you think no. That this group of people? That, that oh, some people. That some, he, some people. He, Aaron these says, pains, these people let, who Aaron, cause a lot of Aaron pain. Aaron says, let not my master's anger flare up. You know that the people is disposed towards evil, the Am. They said to me, uh, <clears throat> this is supposed to be a Yaakov, it's the Am, which is the people, supposed to the children of Yaakov. They said to me, make us a God that will go before us for this man Moshe brought us up out of the land. We do not know what became of him. So I said to them who has gold, they removed, removed it and gave it to me. I threw it into the fire and this calf emerged. Then it says Moshe saw as a result of this. Remember, he was a defender of the people, the previous sentence. He was blaming Aaron. Moshe saw the, pe saw the people that it was Perua, right? Exposed or unrestrained are two, two different translations there. So right. it's too much. For, for Aaron, it's right, pure. for Aaron had exposed them uh, to disgrace among those who rise up against them. The sentence, every time you read a different comment, you'll see a different translation for it. Nobody knows what it means. Mm -hmm. Nobody has a translation for it. Right? Mm -hmm. But the word is paro. Pei reish ayin. Pei reish It's paro. It's clear. Right? Mm -hmm. Is the people are paro. Right? Because of the mitzvot, the, so they are At paro. that moment, because of what Aaron said, he has this realization, and that's when he says, those who are with God stand by me. Mm -hmm. right? At that moment, he does a complete 180. He doesn't blame his brother anymore. He blames the people. Right? There's another curious thing. Group. Throwing the gold into the boiling pot, and out comes a calf. Yeah. Is that magic? Yeah. Well, we discussed that. Yes, that was room. magic. Yeah. That was that was because of. By the way, it happens. Ironically, it happens at one other time. Mm -hmm. Does anybody know the other time it happens? For what? That gold is thrown into a oh, fire. Oh, the menorah. Yeah. That's right. The menorah. When Moshe didn't know how to make the menorah, yeah, pops up. Right. So God said, "You put it in the fire, and the menorah will come out." Yeah. So did yeah. the calf come out yeah. because Hashem wanted to? No, the no, calf came a, out. Well, amulets. This is a whole other argument, what yeah. Hashem wants and doesn't want. I don't, I don't want to read God's mind. I'm not qualified to. But the Medrash tells us that inserted into the sack of gold was the amulet Ale Shor, rise up ox, right? Uh, that would be used to raise the coffin of Yosef from the Nile. And that that's what caused the calf to walk out of the fire in gold. Oh. And in the Zohar, this calf goes through the sky. No, this is a different calf. It's not this calf. I, I, another the, calf. The, the, there is a ritual described 
in the Zohar on the birthday of Paro, where a calf, a golden calf, flies across the Nile. What does that mean? What does it mean? From a mystical perspective, the Zohar. I mean, they're just necromancers. Uh, they just made something happen. There must be a meaning to it. There are many potential meanings. I'm not going to get into it, the Zohar right now. I just want to point out that this calf that was not something that was unique in history. It was something that the Egyptian magicians knew how to do. Mm. You know, mm. They knew how to do this. They did it on a yearly basis. You know, July 4th, we have fireworks. Mm -hmm. They have flying calves. <laughs> or oxes, actually. Mm -hmm. You know, the, the cow jumped over the moon. I don't buy that. <laughs> <laughs> so, <clears throat> so anyway, I would argue that this is a different reason why Aaron became the coin god. He was willing to make the ultimate sacrifice of his life in the world to come to save the venture. And if you'll just bear with me for a moment and think about now understand what I'm suggesting, right, is that God will always be able to remedy this and have the outcome that he wishes. Mm -hmm. Right? Having said that, imagine that these three thousand instigators of this had been alive and well and thriving at the time of the Korach Rebellion. Mm -hmm. Still, the ground could open up and destroy them all. It wouldn't be a problem for God to do, no mm -hmm. question about it, right? But the politics of the situation would have been far more dangerous for Moshe and Aaron mm -hmm. at that moment if these guys were still around as well. Mm -hmm. It was bad enough with Korah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. but, yeah, but, right. yeah. yeah. but, but imagine if they would. Lots of his too. Yeah. But imagine if they had been, if this group had been around yeah. as well. It'd right? be really true. It would have been very dangerous. Yeah. So, what Aaron did was make the ultimate sacrifice, which was to do something that would cost him his life in the world to come, in order to save the Jewish people and God's venture. Mm -hmm. And that, I would posit, is the reason why he becomes Kohen Gadol, because he makes he, this sacrifice. He opens uh, Moshe's eyes, you could say, also, yeah. finally. Yeah. So that's a little bit of thought, mm -hmm. uh, a rare uh, original thought from myself. Mm -hmm. I have to give credit to the Zohar on this, and I have to give credit to my friend Simka Yakovovich. We researched this together years ago, mm -hmm. and this word Perua, you know, every time I read it, by the way, mm -hmm. uh, in a new Chumash, there's another translation from it. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's bizarre, yeah. because nobody really can get their noodle around it. Mm -hmm.